This lesson this morning is about senior saints. And someone might say, well, it's, it's kind of an unusual lesson. This was requested um, to be preached. And so what I'm going to do is today preach about senior saints. Next week, preach about senior saints. And then look at adults. I guess senior saints are adults too. And then youth kind of seasons of life, but today in a more specific way, senior saints. There are now in America more than over, more who are over 65 years of age than those who are teenagers. There are 23 million teens, but 35 million over 65. In 25 years, one in five will be over 65, and one of 10 will be over 80. Some have called this the graying of America. Bob Pope said, we know you're old when the candles cost more than the cake. And by the way, saw something interesting today. Um, we had the Today Show on as we we're getting ready, and it was a celebrity, well, it was a politician, um, and he had a lot of candles on the cake. And instead of huffing and puffing and blowing, He'd pick up one, pick up the other one. And so I guess he was successful in blowing them all out. There are three stages of life, youth, adulthood, and my, you are looking well. Well, the my, you are looking well is today and next week. Then after that, it's adulthood and then youth. Well, there's negative aspects of getting old, and I think we'd all recognize this if there's been a bad habit. Well, lifelong habits can be terribly hard to break. And excuse me. <coughs> and physically, life can be hard with the failing strength of the body. Uh, my dad, as he was probably at that time close to 90 years old, he says, son, getting old is not easy, and I'm not going to do it twice. Then, then mentally, we recognize that there can be a demise, especially if dementia or Alzheimer's attack the mind. But what I want us to do is I want us to see what the Bible says about this graying. Here we find the silver-haired head is a crown of glory if it is found in the way of righteousness. And next week, we're going to look at some other things. But the most important thing is this idea of righteousness you know there was a an older gentleman and he read his bible and almost all he would do was read his bible and finally one day his grandson says grandpa why are you reading your bible all the time he says i'm preparing for my final exam well the reality is death can come at any age and we've all known the young to die Years ago, I started work at Rocky Creek for just the summer, kind of as youth work, and I was visiting the homes of some of the youth to meet the parents, and there was this little boy there in this home, and he said, Daddy, that's the man, and he pointed at me, he said, only the good die young. Uh, no, Billy Joel said that. You might have heard it on the radio, but I've never said that. But the reality is, sometimes people do die young. Death strikes at all ages. But we also do recognize the fact that the older we get, yes, we are truly getting closer to that time. When we die, heaven is all that matters. And so the reality is, that's what should be that matters in here and now if it is found in the way of righteousness. What is righteousness? Well, now we could use that simplest and easiest definition of righteous means doing right. But I think we can find a better definition as you go to Luke chapter 1, verses 5 and 6. And I'm sorry about my voice. It's, it got better, got better. <clears throat> and this morning got worse again. But I'm, I am better. And when I leave here, out in the back is some Germex. 
and I'll slather my hands in it before I shake your hand, though I think I wouldn't be contagious by this point. In Luke chapter 1, verse 5, you read about Zachariah and Elizabeth. Of course, most of you realize that was the mom and the dad of John the Baptist. We get down to verse 6, and it says, and they were both righteous before God. And then here you basically have a good Bible definition of righteous. Walking blamelessly in all the commandments and the statutes of the Lord. In other words, this man is righteous. He's the one that's doing what God says. Now, we might also note, ultimately, the state of righteousness is not simply and only attained by our own goodness. Philippians chapter 3, find there, Paul said, Whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them as rubbish, in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith. So it's not merely... I can be good enough because we all do fall short. We have all sinned. And so we might even say, ultimately, yes, it does come back to God's grace. So we're dependent on God's grace, but then once again, we've got to live righteously. In the book of 1 John, and particularly as you get to chapters 2 through 5, it's almost like there's three tests that John gives. And he mentions them all kind of in a sequence, then mentions them again, then kind of mentions them even the third time. And in the second and third time, sometimes he even mixes them up. But these three tests, one was, what do you believe about Jesus? <coughs> Excuse me. You could call this the faith test. What do you believe about Jesus? Then there was a second, you could call it social test. Do you love the brethren? But then a third, you could call it an obedience test because it's do you do the commandments? And you read about this here in 1 John chapter 3, beginning of verse 7. He says, let no little children, let no one deceive you. Whoever practices righteousness is righteous as he is righteous, speaking of Jesus is righteous. So there were people claiming to walk with God, but the reality is they were walking in darkness. And the man that's not trying to live righteously, he's not righteous. And that's his point. You got to practice righteousness to be righteous. He says, whoever makes a practice of sinning is of the devil, for the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. No one born of God makes a practice of sinning, for God's seed abides in him, and he cannot keep on sinning because he has been born of God. By this it is evident who are the children of God and who are the children of the devil. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor is the one who does not love his brother. And this is the occasion you've got kind of the emphasis on that obedience test, are you doing the commandments? And then he kind of gets in at the very end, that social test does not love his brother. But the emphasis here, you're going to be righteous. You got to do righteous. And so when we talk about that silver or gray-haired head, if it is found in the way of righteousness, well, got to be doing doing right you know it's not enough got to be doing right it's not enough to be doing right all our lives and then as we get older we think well we can fudge we can let it slip a bit you know I ought to get a pass sometime or maybe there ought to be a buy on this old or young Let's live righteously so that we can be righteous. 
But you know, there have been, and this is kind of intrigued me with regards to some of the kings you read about. And sometimes it's almost like you read one thing and the kings get over Chronicles and you find an additional truth that wasn't so pretty. But you can read sometimes of men who were good, declared to be good even, but then later failed and sometimes after many years did the failing. Now someone might think in terms of one of the very best, David. And then they remember that sin of David and Bathsheba or that sin of the time he wanted his armed men, his soldiers counted. But as far as one that stands out above almost any other, Solomon. You remember when Solomon became king? There in 1 Kings 3, beginning of verse 5. And Gideon the Lord appeared to Solomon in a dream by night, and God said, Ask what I shall give you. So God is saying to Solomon, You ask, I'll give it to you. Then Solomon said, Now look at the words of Solomon. You've shown great and steadfast love to your servant David my father, because he walked before you in faithfulness, in righteousness, and uprightness of heart towards you. And you have kept for him this great and steadfast love and have given him a son to sit on his throne this day. And now, O oh Lord my God, now, see, up to this point, <clears throat> He didn't just kind of say, hmm, what do I want? God says, ask and I'll give it. Let me just think. He directs his attention toward God and even the example of his, son, his father, David. He says, and now, O Lord my God, you have made your servant king in place of David my father, although I am but a little child. I know not how to go out or come in. Okay, in perspective, he's an adult. He's not five, six years old. But he recognizes his limitations, especially with judgment. I'm a little child. I do not know how to go out or to come in. And your servant is in the midst of your people whom you have chosen, a great people, too many to be numbered or counted for multitude. Then he says, give your servant, therefore, an understanding mind to govern your people, that I may discern between good and evil, for who is able to govern this your great people? When I look at Solomon, I think his reign has got to be great. And it's got to end great. This is the way he starts. And, and you recall, of course, because he didn't simply just ask for riches or ask for power. God gave him the wisdom, but God also gave him the riches and God gave him the power. God greatly blessed him. And he gets off to a great start. But you remember the ending, the very sad ending as you find in 1 Samuel, 1 Kings 11. Beginning of verse 1, And King Solomon loved many foreign women, along with the daughter of Pharaoh, Moabite, Ammonite, Edomite, Sidonia, and Hittite women from the nations concerning which the Lord had said to the people of Israel, you shall not enter into marriage with them, neither shall they with you, for surely they will turn away your heart after their gods. Solomon clung to these in love. He had 700 wives, princesses, and 300 concubines. And his wives turned away his heart. For when Solomon was old, he in a very specific way, he started out good when he was younger. 
Now he's old, it says. His wife's turned away his heart after other gods, and his heart was not wholly true to the Lord his God, as was the heart of David his father. For Solomon went after Ashtoreth, the goddess of the Sidonians, and after Milcom, the abomination of the Ammonites. So Solomon did what was evil in the sight of the Lord and did not wholly follow the Lord, as did David his father had done. Solomon, Solomon. And you know, sometimes they have questions I ask. Well, if he had this wisdom, why did he do this? It's a good question. Wisdom is the ability to make the decision. It almost really says nothing about then doing what you know is right. In fact, for the many sins that men have succumbed to, was it they didn't know it was right? They didn't have the judgment that wisdom to know it was right or wrong? They knew the right, they knew the wrong. And they chose to do the wrong. He had the wisdom to know what he was doing was wrong. But he did it anyway. Now there's others. You find, for instance, Azariah and Uzziah. And as you would be in, in Kings, you'd find his name is Azariah. When you get over to Chronicles, you find him as Uzzah. I mean, Uzziah. Here you read in 2 Kings 15, 1, in the 25th year of Jeroboam, king of Israel, Azariah, the son of Amaziah, king of Judah, began to reign. He was 16 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned 52 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Jechaliah of Jerusalem. He did what was right in the eyes of the Lord, according to all his father Amaziah had done. So here we see the good. But you get over to 2 Chronicles, you find, but when he was strong, he grew proud to his destruction, and he was unfaithful to the Lord his God, and entered the temple of the Lord to burn incense on the altar of incense. But Azariah the priest went in after him with 80 priests of the Lord who were men of valor. And they withstood King Uzziah and said, It is not for you, Uzziah, to burn incense to the Lord and for the priest, the sons of Aaron, who were consecrated to burn incense. Go out of the sanctuary, for you have done wrong. And it will bring you no honor from the Lord God. So here, he's declared good, but yet then we read the bad. Joash, we find in 2 Chronicles 24, he did what was right in the eyes of the Lord. But then you get down to 2 Chronicles 24, 17 through 19, after the death of Jehoiada, they abandoned the house of the Lord, the God of their fathers, and served Ashram and their idols. So good for a time, and then went bad. Asa, you find that 1 Kings 15, 11. Asa did what was right in the eyes of the Lord. And in 2 Chronicles chapter 16, beginning of verse 12, here you read in these verses, you relied on the king of Syria, did not rely on the Lord your God. You have done foolishly in this. And so here we see several who have done good to start with and then changed. The point being, Lives lived faithful to God need to continue to be lived faithful to God. You know, these are some Bible examples, but I have an idea. Every one of you knows someone, maybe in their 20s, their 30s, their 40s, maybe even their 50s, faithful to God, but then at some point, something changed. Maybe they're not as faithful as we thought they were. Maybe that's true. Maybe it's just that maybe secret sins were made public, but yet at a latter time, they made a choice to live ungodly lives. Everybody here has probably known someone that fits that scenario. We need to be careful, you see, that the silver hair, the gray-haired one, be found in the way of righteousness. Now, are there some senior sins? I mean, literally, are there some sins that are 
more unique maybe to those who are older. I, you know, I would suggest that we'd have to say, well, no, no and yes. Um, you know, I read in 2 Timothy 2.22, flee youthful passions or flee youthful lust. As if there's some things that can be a, a little more of a problem for the young than the old. And it might even suggest that could there be something a little more uh, difficult for the old and the young. Now we could say that, yes, every person potentially subject to every temptation. Uh, now I know this, though. There's some things that tempt some folks that don't others. I mean, this literally don't others. And then there's some things that tempt this person and don't tempt the other. How do we explain that? It's not always so easy to explain. But regardless of the temptation, it must be resisted. The temptation itself is not sin. But we must resist the temptation. Now, these are some things suggested by way of study uh, that I've seen others have suggested, and I think they are uh, valid to consider. One person says that the seniors need to watch out for selfishness and stinginess. Now, we might take a step back and say, what do you mean by that? Well, do you remember that rich man? Read up in the Bible? <laughs> I've got much goods laid up for many years. So, take thine ease, eat, drink, and be merry. In other words, kind of taking a position of, well, you know, <clears throat> here I've saved up and I've, I've worked hard and now I have this nest egg and, and it's mine and I'm going to enjoy it. Oh, by the way, it's all right to spend your kids' inheritance. <clears throat> that just kind of represents the idea a little bit sometimes of, you know, it, you know it's, it's all mine. As stinginess, you know, and we can kind of understand this. You know, somebody's worked. Oh no, something's happened. I got this emergency and it's costing me. And then, well, I work a few extra hours next week. I can take on an extra job. Or I can take out this loan and I know that, you know, I, I can cover it over the next year and get me over this hump. Get to a point where the person is truly a senior. At that point, oftentimes, assets become fixed. Incomes becomes, income becomes fixed. And, and uh, it's kind of like, I don't know how long I'll live, but it's got to last this long, and so i got to hang on to it. i got to be careful with it. Well, now, I would say this. We need to be responsible at all ages with what God blesses us with. We also need to avoid the idea of, it's just for me, or I better keep it to the point that I'm just being stingy, not being the generous person that God would want me to be. You know, I, I looked at that, though. You know, that, that bears considering giving up. <clears throat> Sometimes people, I've retired from my job. I'm going to retire from, well, I was a, a Bible, I'm going to retire from being a Bible class teacher. Um, these things be not, be, need to be done at, at, at church. Uh, let somebody younger do them. They've got more strength, more energy. I'm going to retire from that. Or, you know, you could name it. How that at some point, there's this giving up attitude. Now, sometimes this giving up attitude, it can be brought on because, yes, there can become limitations that are real and that a person needs to recognize Physically, there can be limitations. There are some people who want to be here today, and they're not here because of physical limitations. What their body's just not letting them do anymore. There's times we get to a point where we would like to... There are men who would like to stand in this pulpit and lead public prayer. There are men who formerly stood before the audience and, and taught a Bible class. But their mind's not as sharp as it used to be. And it's gotten to the point that they just, they feel like they can't really trust their mind. There can be, there can be limitations. But I need to be careful 
not to give up anything before truly my physical or mental limitations prevent me from doing it. You know, I need to have the attitude of use me. In fact, if someone is able to hit retirement from their jobs and still have generally good physical and mental health, those ought to be some of the best servants of the Lord that there are in a congregation. Because they're not spending now the 40 to 60 hours at the workplace. And they have more time. It ought to truly be an attitude of use me instead of giving up. When physical and mental limitations come, recognize it. And be honest with yourself. But in the meantime, have an attitude of use me. Bitterness. And by the way, very clearly, let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from among you along with all malice. Bitterness. You've had bad things to happen. And by the way, I've met people who have become a widow or widower, maybe lost one or two children. And you've met as well people who've maybe had financial difficulties and setbacks or, or physical health problems. You know, cancer is not easy. Congestive heart failure is not easy. Heart disease is not easy. Renal failure is not easy. Disappointment is not easy. So watch out for bitterness and doubt. James said, let him ask in faith with no doubting. But yet some people have had this lifetime, maybe, maybe of praying and they... And, and they have failed to recognize the time God answered. And, and they want to blame God when He answered no. And now they begin to doubt. A strong faith that turned to doubt. Unbecoming speech, we might say, no, no, no. Now, I can't tell you the times I've heard this little phrase. He, she has lost their filter. Most of you have heard that phrase before. This still applies. Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such as is good for building up as fits the occasion that it may give grace to those who hear. This applies across the board. Young, middle-aged, old. Don't, don't, don't lose your filter. Despising youth. You know, we find in 1 Timothy 4, 12, let no one despise you for your youth. Well, <clears throat> is it going to be young people that despise the youth? Probably not. It's probably those who are, to some degree, older. And sometimes there can be a problem of, of those who are older trusting those who are younger in various ways and fashions. So this we need to be on guard about. Now, I have an idea that if you were to think in terms of the various stages of life, youth, adulthood, and my, you're looking well. Well, you might have a different list of temptations to watch out for during this period of years. These are just some suggested ones that we consider. Senior saints... The important thing about this gray hair, this silver hair, is that it be found in the way of righteousness. As we close, I pray that you would want to be a Christian. Live that faithful life as a Christian. And so that when that time comes that you breathe your last breath, that it's with hope that you enter eternity. And you have that anticipation of hearing well done, thou good and faithful servant. If we could assist you in your obedience, 
If with faith you've turned from your sin, that's repentance. We can give you this opportunity to confess that faith. And we can assist you in being baptized, immersed for the forgiveness of sins. If there's a need for prayer, we'd be glad to take the time and pray for you. Need to come, please come as we stand.